I enjoyed that last week. That was, that was good. I'm excited tonight that my wife is with me, and uh, some of y'all don't know everything about us, but I will tell you this, that at the age of 14, she started raising me, and I have become the great man that I am because of her. <laughs> that is a joke, y'all. That, that is a joke. Now, uh, I started watching her go to the bus when I was 14 years old, and I decided right then that that was, that was my wife. That was going to be my woman. And uh, somebody will ask her, how did you end up with him? And she'll tell him he was like gum on my shoes. So that's the way that she ended up with me. I am excited that she's here and that y'all get to meet her. She's the light of my life. If you would, turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter, the third chapter, uh, verses 8 through 12. Tonight we'll make this a very textual sermon tonight, which they all need to be anyway. Uh, and let's read this scripture quickly, and I'll make some comments as we go along tonight. First Peter, the third chapter, verses 8 through 12. Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Love as brothers. Be tenderhearted. Be courteous. Not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing for, as he quotes from the book of Psalms, he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it, for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Think about today in the world that we live in, how many people die of suicide every day. I don't have a modern uh, number on that, but it's a lot. I remember back in the 80s, it was like in the, in the 80s. And uh, I don't know what it is now, but I'm sure it's a whole lot more than that. And we realize that mental health is, is a big problem in our world today. And, one of the pro and it's a big problem that is facing us today. But this passage talks about the possibility of loving life, of seeing good days, which was quoted from Psalms, the 34th chapter. Finally, Peter says in concluding the guidelines about these various relationships in life, that loving life involves proper relationships with, number one, the Lord, from verse 12, and number two, others, from verse 8 through 11. If we're to get through life, if we're to love life, these are so important to us. In fact, they're the key to us getting along in life and enjoying life. You know, Jesus said that he came to give a full and abundant life. And I, as I've told y'all before here in this pulpit, that doesn't just mean heaven. That has to do with this life that we live here. And think about the things that we enjoy as brothers and sisters in the church. I think about the things that y'all are doing right now for the Meeks family. I think about all the years that y'all had them here in this church and how you loved on them and how you helped them through their problems. And now at, at the end of Barbara's life, how y'all have stepped up and how you're doing so much. What a wonderful thing it is for us, brother, to share fellowship and to love one another. So our loving and life involves these relationships with the Lord and it involves those things with others. If one would love life, requirements are set for, Peter says, for loving life. May I challenge you, first of all, Peter says from verse 8, that we are to love the brethren. Think about what division produces. It produces tensions amongst us. When we walk through that door, we don't need to be tense seeing our brother. We, we need to be happy. It's an exciting time. Uh, brother, brother Ed related to me what a good time y'all had this morning and how loud y'all were this morning. And how, You know, there's just a lot going on because y'all have seen a lot of people you had not seen in a while. Old Burl's back. I'm even proud to see old Burl back tonight. Man, that's a good thing. And, and it's so exciting when we get together as brothers and sisters. But when there's tensions among us, all of us can feel it, can't we? We know that when there, there's something that's strained, when there's something that's bothering somebody, and it, it separates us. We know to be like-minded. Character is both determined and revealed by that which one has in his mind. We are to let the Spirit of the Lord control our minds. We know that the Bible says that we were raised with Christ. 
and Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. That's where our minds are pointed. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. What a warm passage that is. Here's another verse. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts to which you were called to one body and be thankful. Yes, brethren, we are thankful for the brethren. We're to weep with those who weep as we're doing right now uh, with that wonderful, wonderful family and people that have spent their life here at this church. And that's what we do together. And it's until you get on the other end of that, you don't really realize what it's all about, do you? Till someone loses a loved one. I will never forget how moving it was for me for our home church, Owens Crossroads, when my dad and my mom died, and how those ladies for years that I'd known all my life toiled all, all, for a day or two getting that food ready, and what a feast that we had. And what a celebration of life we had as we sit down in that fellowship hall there at the church, and our friends were there with us. I can't tell you, if you haven't experienced that yet, I'm not trying to push you forward to have that experience. But when you do have that experience, it's, it's so wonderful to be on the receiving end of that. It's just great. And boy, that's what we share together with our brethren. We love our brethren. We're to let the Spirit of the Lord control our minds and let his peace rule in our hearts and to have compassion. You know, when you look into that Greek word, which Ricky could probably pronounce it, some of y'all others, I can't pronounce that word, but it starts with an S. It talks about Jesus having compassion. You remember he was in the boat and he was teaching and he was tired and, and, and uh, the, his disciples were saying, we need to get off, we need to go. And the Bible says he looked up at those people and he had compassion. You know what kind of compassion that was from that Greek word? He hurt in his belly because of them. He hurt for them. Because they were there and they were just feasting on him. Let's go back, y'all. I got to talk to these people. Y'all know I'm paraphrasing that. That's what it's all about. And brother, we're to be, have compassion on people. We're to be sympathetic. Don't you love what's going on in the world right now? Even though those people are being so oppressed over there by the Russian army. Uh, of how they're calling out and how they're looking at, at, at solving those things and facing those things. And, and how they're all together and they're working in that war together. In a sense, that's what we're doing here as Christians. We're working in this war together, and this war that is against evil, and it brings us together, and it brings us together tighter because we are sympathetic with each other. We care about each other. We know we're suffering, but we're suffering together. And think about what great strength that that uh, brings us. Sympathy and selfishness do, do not coexist. Did y'all hear what I said? Sympathy and selfishness do not coexist. He also says that we're to be tender-hearted. So much suffering about us and we can become so callous. But brethren, we don't need to do that. We need to be tender-hearted, loving, and caring and put on the tender mercies that God has for us and not become calloused. He says also we need to be humble-minded. We, we need to be courteous. What makes us humble-minded? Humility comes from a realization and a dependence on God. It's saying, I know that I'm subject to God. As I spoke this morning at, at, at New Hope, I, I, I talked about that this morning, uh, that God feeds us. You know, God gives us strength. And when we rely on him, we know that nothing that we have here is ours. Y'all think about how possessive over the years that we've been. Think about some of the things that as you get on up to, to where I'm at in life, uh, some of those things that you work so hard to have. Did y'all hear what I said, things? You work so and now they don't make a hill of beans. They don't, it don't even matter anymore. You know, because uh, kind of my mentality right now uh, is, well, well, I'm going to leave that to the kids anyway. Uh, let, them, let them do with it, you know. That's kind of my attitude. All that has changed. Why? Because I accepted this. I am humble in the fact, we're all humble as Christians in the fact that God's going to take care of us and there's nothing here that can compare to the riches that he has for each one of us and, and what's waiting on us. We need to be humble-minded and we need to realize that we have a dependence on God and that makes us humble. Humility comes from a standard which is perfect. We see from verse 21, if y'all read that 
From verse 21, it talks about that. The second thing he says to do, Peter, is that we need to control the tongue. Everybody got control of all that. I have a little problem sometimes. Sometimes I'll, uh, and it seems like when we get a little older, we, we got our, our filter changes a little bit. I don't, I don't have how much filter as I had used to have. I got to really watch what I say. Because a lot of times we'll just say stuff just right off the cuff, just right off the of mind. We'll just say that thought without thinking about it first. You know, don't we love that little rule we need to pray for something before we do something? A lot of times I don't do that with my tongue. And I think that's very normal. But think about what the tongue can cause us, all the problems we... Uh, have you got into this yet, Steve, uh, in, in your class on James? Okay. So I won't say a whole lot about that, but I, I guarantee Steve's lit you up about some of that stuff. The potential of the tongue brings hurt on ourselves, and it brings hurt on others. We really need to watch what we say, especially with our brethren. Uh, great fires start with small fires. Look over to uh, James, the third chapter with me, and let's start in about verse 5. Even so, the tongue is a little member, and it boasts great things. See how great a forest, <laughs> a great a forest, a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire. It's a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature. And it is set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird of reptile and of creature of sea have been tamed and has been tamed by all mankind but no man can tame the tongue it is an unruly evil full of deadly poison with it we bless our God their father and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God out of the same mouth proceed blessings and curses my brethren, these things ought not to be so. Oh, brethren, how we need to watch out, Peter says, about our tongue. James says, other scripture says. We need to watch the things we say and how we say them. And bring that tender-hearted part into this also. You know, to be easy on people. Sometimes I get so disgusted uh, with younger people. We, when we're raising our kids, you know, we want them all to pick up everything just right like that and learn those things because we can see exactly where they're going. Can you imagine how God must feel? You can see exactly where they're going when they get into something, you know, and we try our best to stop it, but we can't. And, and we just have these great arguments, these great squabbles uh, about all those things, and sometimes we'll say things that we shouldn't say. I can't tell you, and I don't even want to try to count how many times I have said things that I shouldn't have said, things that hurt somebody else. Would well, that not be in my intention? But I wasn't cautious enough. I, I didn't care enough to say things and say things properly or not just, just not say anything at all. The third thing he talks about is to leave evil alone. Just leave it alone. Just don't go there. Don't go close to it. Go away from it. Note the number of times that Peter talks about evil in this scripture. Five times he talks about that. It's opposite of being righteous, isn't it? The word there, the Greek word, is kekos. It's base. It's wrong. It's wicked. It's troublesome. It's destructive, according to there would be the definition of that. You remember Psalms in 34th chapter, verse 21 said, evil shall slay the wicked. I don't want to be evil. I want to go the other way. Peter says, stay away from that. Just leave it alone. Evil is subject to identification. You can know what it is. You can know what it is. You can look at it according to Hebrews 5 and 14. One way to depart from evil is to do good. Just do good and you'll stay away from evil. I like to tell couples when I'm counseling them, why don't you start your marriage out? And before you go off to sleep, you grab your mate, you hug your mate, and you pray with them. And I'm going to tell you, things will go a whole lot better in your life. You overcome evil with doing good. 
You know, and, and you, you, you do things like that as a precautionary thing. You know, I want to guard this. I, this is precious. I, I want to keep it. I want to keep this love alive. Uh, you know, I want to keep this relationship alive. That's how we overcome that. Number four, he says, look for peace. Look for peace. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall see God. Don't you love the Beatitudes? I know uh, y'all have studied that lately, I think. Don't you love the things that, that the Lord says there, you know, in, in that big sermon that he preached? Don't you wonder how many times he probably preached that sermon? Just how precious, and how that one phrase means so much. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall see God. Some evidently encourage strife. It's possible always to be a peacemaker according to what Jesus said. And we need to make our peace with God according to Romans the 5th chapter and verse 1. We need to make that peace. And it needs to be what's on our heart and on our minds. We need to look for peace. And finally, Peter says, we need to pray to God. Prayer is the antidote to anxiety, y'all. It's the antidote to it to anxiety we're going through so much fear right now we're worried about this we're worried about that we're always that we just got through COVID we're worried about this we're worried about that all the time and Jesus says what can that add to your life that worry it's not something that a man of God does it's easy for me to say isn't it think about that we need to pray more and more Y'all know what the Bible says in Philippians 4, chapter, verses 6 and 7. With thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ. Oh, brother, we have so many tools to overcome this fear thing that we, that we go through all the time. We're always worried about this, worried about that. Where I can pay this, where I can pay that. Where, where this is going to happen and that's going to happen. And most of the time, I guarantee you, if you go back and count all the things that you're worried about, probably, I, I, don't, I don't have a percentage of it, but it's going to be a very low percentage that's going to happen. And we just worry and we just fret over those things. It just robs us of our day. It just, just takes the good thoughts out of the way. And, and, and this fear just, just rubs us the way that it shouldn't. And, and that's why Jesus took that on he took it on he said don't worry about it don't God feed the birds doesn't God take care of all this how much more does he love you I mean wake up y'all we are created in his image we are special and God's going to take care of us boy don't that get us through when we talk about peace when we talk about fear when we contrast the two are y'all worried about the end I'm not worried about it. Somebody asked me, well, this might be World War III. I don't know what's going to happen. I said, I don't know what's going to happen, but I can tell you this. God's going to destroy this earth. Man ain't going to. And that's just the way it is because that's what the Bible says, and God's never went back on his word. He's going to do it. So the one that's got control of all that, why in the world should I fear? Why should I fear anything? Because God has got my back. God is my God. And we need to pray to him, and we need to overcome those things in that way. Wouldn't it be awful to hear or to be what Peter says in verse 12? The face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Do y'all want God's face to be turned from you? No, we don't want that, do we? No way do we want that. But that can actually happen. You think about what happened in the book of Isaiah, the 59th chapter. You know, Isaiah is just in and out. He's saying, repent. Straighten up. God's going to do this. God's going to do that. And then he says, God loves you so much. Look at where you're at and look at where God wants you to be. He's just wrestling with that. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, y'all. It's still out there. It's still reaching. It can still pull you back, okay? Nor is his ear heavy, but your iniquities have separated you from God. Brandon, has God got his back? Has God got his face turned away from us? I hope not. Your iniquities have separated you from God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. Wouldn't it be a sad thing to go through life and to think that God won't hear you? 
that God has, has turned his back. Brethren, sometimes God has to give us some very rough treatment according to Hebrews, the 12th chapter, I think it is, when he talks about chastising us and correcting us and doing all those things to us. But how much God loves us through all that. You know, and he, he uses the analogy of the good father, you know. Uh, you, your father didn't, didn't spare the rod. He, he didn't spare uh, spanking you. He didn't spare uh, correcting you. And you respected him and you loved him. Well, God's going to do the same thing. For, for God not to turn his back on us, we have to turn to him. For God to keep his eye on us, we have to turn to him. God loves us so much, y'all. He loves us so much. Do you love life? Or do you hate it? Think about that question. Ecclesiastes 2 and verse 17 refers to that. Remember God in your youth. The, the Bible would say, enjoy pleasant memories of age. Ecclesiastes 12 and 1. Remember now your creator in the days of your youth. He qualifies this. Before the difficult days come, and the years draw near when you say, I have no pleasure in them. You kids, take that as advice. While you are young, while you feel good, while you feel you are invincible, remember God. You want to have a happy life? Remember God. He will get you through and he will fill you with a peace and a joy that is beyond measure. But when you get to be an old man like me and you've assembled all these things and you've, you've lived through all those things, you say to yourself, and the years draw near when you say, I have no pleasure in them. What do you mean? I have no pleasure in living. I have plenty of pleasure in living, but I know that's not where it's at. I know that the result, you know that the result should be that eternal home. That place where we're perfected. That place where there'll be no more pain. Where there'll be no more sorrow. Where there'll be no more tears. That place where we'll be in the presence of God. That place where we'll be able to look at his face. And where we will have his purity. That is the goal of the Christian. And I think that's everything of what Solomon has to say in Ecclesiastes. Even though he didn't have the grasp on heaven that we had. He was still a prophet. There was a whole lot I'm sure that he did know about heaven but no it hadn't been revealed to him like it has to us and we know that place that place that is promised and that's the goal and that's why when we look at these years and these these last years draw near and we have health problems we have all these fights with 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 not fights we have all these problems with our health and we just say i don't want any more there's an old movie uh that I like to watch. It's about a man in, at the end of his life. It's a, it's a worldly movie. Uh, but it has a great story. And at the end, the death angel has come to get him. And the death angel appears to him. Y'all, I told y'all now this is a movie, okay? The death angel appears to him and he says, I'm going to take you. And he, and, well, he's not ready. He's got all these things going. It's his birthday. And his daughters had planned this... His, this was a very wealthy man, a man that was very respected. Everybody loved him and cared about him, you know. He was a great businessman, you know. And his business is being taken over, and he's having a, having a look at that. And his two daughters have said, uh, Daddy, we want to give you a great go-away party. You know, we want to give you a great birthday party. So that's the time that he's going to leave. And the angel stands and waits on him. And he gets up and he makes his speech to all his friends that have been assembled to him. All, all the people that have meant something in his life. All the people that are precious to him. And his daughters are right there by his side. And, and you can just feel the love uh, that is portrayed there amongst them. And he stood up and he talked about his life and how successful his life was and how he'd been so happy. And he said, now as I look at y'all, I can tell you this. I don't want any more. Wow. To get to the end of our life and say, I don't want anything more. That is God feeding us. What else can I have? What else can I do that's going to make me happy? There's nothing going to make me happy except being with him. It's so important, brethren, to us. And, and God loves us so much. 
And I want to see his face one day. And, and we'll have a way that we touch or, or whatever happens. I, I just can't wait for that day. And I hope you feel the same. And I hope that as you grow year after year after year in age, that, that we all remember that, that that's the goal, is getting to heaven. And the goal when me and you walked in that door tonight, and, and we greeted everybody and we shook each other's hand and we laughed and carried on and everybody went on about how crazy Harold was and, all, and Alvin was this morning and all that kind of stuff and how crazy some of y'all are of what we enjoy together and that those, all those little encouraging things that we do together those things that you're about to do when you go over there to that fellowship hall tonight all those little things accumulated together are helping you reach the goal and God is using us to get there together to do those things. What a wonderful thing it is to be called a Christian, brethren. What a wonderful thing it is to have our brethren to love us and to help us to get to that goal. Now tonight, I don't know if I'm talking to anyone that's not a Christian. But if I am, I want to tell you this. There's nothing greater that you can do than become a Christian. There's nothing greater you can do than to wear that name of Christ. There's nothing greater in this world than to be called after him. There's nothing greater than to follow uh, our leader who has wrote this down for us and he has recorded this absolute truth for us and he's given us this book and he said follow this book and if you follow this book one day I'll open it and I'll judge you. And brother I want to tell you uh, our friends let me tell you this if you're not a Christian tonight that he's going to open that book and he gave the orders. He even showed himself being baptized. And he asked all of us to believe in him, to confess his name, to repent, to change our ways, and to say from this moment on, Jesus, you're going to be Lord of my life, and to be baptized in those waters for the forgiveness of your sins, and to be raised to walk that new spiritual life. And to, as it says in Revelations 2 and verse 10, that we would be faithful to the point of death. If you're not a Christian tonight, would you consider that? Would you consider obeying the Lord? There's nothing greater you can do. If there's anyone here tonight that, that needs the prayers of the church, we, we offer an invitation every time we get together, and we ask you to respond to that invitation. If you have any need, do so as we stand and as we sing.